In the last week, it's come in the news that um, Cardinal Fernandez, the head of the Dicastery, the Doctrine of the Faith, wrote a book in 1998 that was buried but was uncovered. And this would have been written when he was 36 years old that focused on union with God through biological excitement or bodily um, euphoria using um, the base bodily functions of the human person in order to um, achieve closer union with God. Today we're going to talk about what is that type of spirituality and um, how does it differ from um, a traditional spirituality. We're going to pull those two apart and we're going to line them up into their camps and we're going to look at where they come from, what they mean. So let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful. Grant that by that same spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. So let's ask the question, is there an evil spirituality? If so, how do you differentiate it from a good spirituality? You will definitely come away from this talk today with some new knowledge and new things to think about, um, things that you probably haven't heard other places. Christ warned us many times, and this was in the background of the early church's mind. The church, the body of Christ, not just the the world, but the body of Christ is divided into two confusingly joined groups that at the end of time will be separated from each other. They will not remain united forever, but to the shock of many, they will find themselves in a different group than they anticipated. Here's some supporting scripture. Matthew 13:24 through 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. Matthew thirteen thirty six to 43 Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those that practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. Or the parable of the net, Matthew thirteen forty seven to 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gather, gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. And we see a parallel in Matthew twenty five thirty one to 46. In this passage, Jesus speaks about the final judgment, where the righteous are separated from the unrighteous, and he uses the metaphor of a shepherd separating sheep and goats. Um, A book has surfaced from a prominent cardinal, the head of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith. And this is this office is the modern equivalent of the Inquisition. It's in the job of the Inquisition historically and, and in the modern day as the as the, under the new title, its job is to identify heresy. Well, he wrote a book back in the 1990s, and while he states 
that he would not write that book today, he has not repudiated it or its contents. He says he's described it better in later works, but he's, he hasn't repudiated the book. The book contains a graphic and glorifying description of adult content in the life of the church, depending on one's state in life. For example, it details as positive the temptations of girls um, too young to be married. And um, it also it describes in great, teal, great detail um, in a way that at times does, does not indicate that we are talking about married life, the private practices that people have in, um, in their um, conjugal or mar marital activities. It's something that should be specific only to married couples after marriage. And the discussion of these private functions of married couples is described in a way that does not about these things, but not in ways that are procreative. So it's, it's things that are like a use of a function, but it doesn't talk about having kids. It talks about these in just an experience, not about having kids, and not related to that function at all. So not related to life, to bringing life. To, um. So he's highlighting in the book the presence of... Um, He's, he's, what he's doing is he's kind of focusing in this book on bodily ecstasy, and he's not talking about spiritual, the spiritual ecstasy. Or the, he's, he's, there's two sides. He's trying to compare bodily ecstasy with a spiritual ecstasy, and he's focusing on the body. And he did research on the body in order to do this. So, um, the writings. Uh, so he tries to use the writings of Hildegard von Bingen to, to compare it to his work. She does have some descriptions of some of the functions of the way people in, engage with each other, but um, but but he he does it in a way which is much different. I mean, he focuses more very deeply on the body and the senses, and not on union. And, and often Hildegard, when she wrote about these things, was talk, was writing from um, was writing from from divine revelation so she was being guided by God and it was talking about the way married couples relate to each other it wasn't talking about this function of the body as a divine ecstasy this is a different kind of thing in in a sense his book you know, it probably it seems more like like um, esoteric um, occult practices or the old goddess worship uh, from the pre-christian world where people commune with spirits and it, what comes to mind is a post-Christian in the early church there was a group of Gnostics who believed that you that, that we were um, destined for or, or certain people, I shouldn't say we were certain, certain selected people were brought into the mysteries and were destined through these rituals for divine unions or unions with angels unions with, they didn't call them angels I don't think, but they were like they were like um, spiritual bridegrooms and you would basically you approach this wedding chamber to this bridegroom chamber where you joined in this mystical marriage with this being and so it's very similar to that it's similar to so you see this in the pre-christian world and in, in terms of the the cults the goddess cults that often had these kinds of themes and then you see it in the in the post in the christian world in gnosticism and in some heretical sects that focused on the idea of union with spirits in this bodily way. And then you see it in later mystical and occult practices in theosophy and other, um, like, as the as we went go forward in history, now the occult has these practices that have continued to pervade. So he's kind of tying into that culture is what it seems like. He wouldn't say he is, but it really does appear to be the case that he is. So in, in reality, there is a realm of angels, both faithful and unfaithful, both holy and profane. And in the life of prayer, the Christian will be broadcasting their prayers out into this world. So you're going to be praying, and, um, and, and, and it's clear from many practice many many situations we've seen and we see in our own life that people will be praying and they will get an, uh, the wrong person response right they'll get a temptation or something that leads them astray and they'll have to discern whether what they're hearing is from God so their prayers go out and they aren't necessarily only received by God and not only received by the saints but they're received by other spirits as well 
And we have to realize that. That's something people don't often take into account, that you're kind of broadcasting your prayers out there, and you have to be discerning what comes back and how you act in response to it. So we, you, if, if what comes back is, is promiscuous, in the end, if, if, it, if it leads you towards this... Um, if it leads towards things like are discussed in this book, right? If it leads towards towards bodily pleasures or bodily minds, or it leads you to uh, thinking um, thoughts that, that you're special and set apart or secrecy, then um, you got to be very careful of those, and you need to really discern what you're hearing. It's important that we do not let our prayers and spiritual uh, practices lead us down a road um, that's promiscuous ex- or, or ex or d- uh, prone to exploitation because in the end you know you'll think that you're being chosen and this is special but you're being made fun of this whole time you are being demeaned and it will it will come out in the end that you're being demeaned and one way to do that we don't engage in these types of thoughts so if a, if a thought comes to you you don't let that thought come to mind you don't open yourself to it and if it's if it's coming to you you don't take part in it right you let yourself pass by that thought and don't don't accept it we should reject always uh, things that lead us to sinful acts um, with ourselves or others um, or, or even sinful thoughts. I want to posit that the wheat and the tares in the church are separated um, down one form of differentiation along the lines of that, that is engaged in the types of, of practices that that we prize, that we try to practice. We should pr- try to practice self-control, sobriety in the spiritual life, in how we identify. Um, and we can see this in recent revelation, right? We can see this in the revelations. The idea that, that Mary talks about when she appears, when we see these visions of, of Mary, she often appears and in, in, in encourages people to self-control and spiritual um, renunciation and obedience but but does never never encourages people to secret um relationships that of of uh, pleasureful you know pursuits or ecstatic relationships you don't pursue ecstasy you pursue sobriety and you you pursue self-control and god is is kind and but you should never respond in 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 a seeking out ecstasies or seeking out desiring these types of um especially not bodily bodily um ends and we can see. Uh, my, I think that we can see that that this is that, that this kind of spirituality is is coming up, is ascending up the hierarchy in the Catholic Church. That we can maybe like, this is this book is an indication to me that maybe we can see this esoteric spirituality that popping its head out right in our church. Um, and I think you can see it in in Protestant Christianity, especially with um, highly emotional movements. Um, and you can see that they what they manifest in is sin. But you can see maybe under the hood here. This is a little bit of a, a look under the sheets, I think, to see a book like this. Where is the spirituality of this priest? So he was a priest back in night. He was 35 years old, 36 years old when he wrote this book. So imagine he'd been a priest for a decade, you know, maybe about a decade. And um, then he wrote this book. So he spent 10 years of his life as a priest leading up to this to where he thought the ideal way to have a spiritual life could be written about in terms of bodily pleasure. And that might be, in a sense, the the ultimate, um, the ultimate um, expression of your of your union with God could be done could be thought of in terms of bodily activity or bodily experiences. And so, just to think about that, that you could live ten years as a priest and be going in that direction. So, what that tells us is there's a whole different ethos and a whole different way of thinking under the surface from that. And I think we need to realize that that's the case, that the devil is in our churches, the devil is in the Catholic Church, the devil is, is up the hierarchy, and he's hidden. And I think we can identify, in a sense, where he is, in, at least in part, by looking at uh, types of spirituality like this. So this secret arrangement, deceptive spirit will attempt to form with you. Um, that the, the the deceptive spirit will attempt to form with you will be supported by forgetting 
uh, or a re- re- rejection of the letter of the law, of the commandments, of following the rules, and impressing you with ecstasies and delusions. They will draw your mind and your allegiance to them so tightly that without the help of heaven, you will not be able to break free. If you are hearing this now, and you know what I am talking about, and this is affecting you, tomorrow you will, you will have been overcome again by that powerful force unless you beg God, beg Our Lady, beg our risen Christ, our risen Lord, beg them for help and the holy martyrs to intercede for you. You cannot get out of it on your own. You can feel moments of repentance when you're in a state like this, when you've been taken by these, these esoteric spirits, but the next day, and I've seen it many times, and I've seen it in a sense in my own life, and I've seen it in other people's lives, the next day you won't, you won't feel the same. You, it's, you can't maintain control long enough to free yourself. So you need the help of heaven. You can't get out without, without the help of God. You have to beg the holy martyrs to intercede. Beg Our Lady to intercede. Your mind, when you are locked in one of these units, cannot escape without help. Make sacrifices, repent, and pray. You will be deluded with pleasures of the flesh. Um, you'll be told you have been chosen as the one or that you are one of the few best. Maybe you're a leader. You're set apart from the unworthy. Um, your answer to that is sobriety, humility, alignment to Christ, your own cross, openness, and talk to others. You have to be open. You can't take. You can't let yourself live in these secrets. Even a lot of times, um, the the sinful practices that so someone would engage in in a union like this um, would keep them from talking to others about it because they're embarrassed about it. They also feel that they're superior to others, and so they don't want to talk to other people in order to because they don't think they deserve to hear it. But being open, not just in confession, I would say take it to confession, but also go to confession, but also find people in your life, in your family, somebody, people close to you that you can talk to, not just people, certainly not somebody who's complicit with you, right? It's got to be uh, people who are objective and external to that process and who are who are not going to be weak and say whatever you do is okay. You have somebody who's going to be um, look at it with a scrutinizing sense. You have, to, you have to expose this sinfulness to them that you're lying to yourself about and living in this, this private union with the spirit. Um, it, and in a sense, this is true of all secret sin. All the secret sins we have, we need to treat like this. But especially if you have um, established a union with a spirit inside. And again, you can see this. I think you can see the, uh, the inkling of this in this book. Um, the idea that you're establishing these fleshly unions. These are enslaving in the end. You think you're free in expressing yourself, but you'll find out that you are enslaved. What seems like liberty instead will show itself as the abuse and, uh, abusive and profane liberty of an oppressor. Somebody taking liberty on you instead of you having liberty. It'll be, some, it'll be an oppressor uh, taking liberty on you. Like a great bait and switch, the script will be flipped. And all that freedom, that feeling of being chosen, that self-worth will be turned to worthlessness and slavery in the end. And you'll get tastes of that through this life. The answer is sobriety, the law union to God and um, God alone and, and, not, you're not, and, and not, not basically letting yourself think of yourself as the chosen one or the one set apart or uh, special, special private unions. So another sign, I think, of this type of esoteric spirituality is um, an idea of, I called it Catholic out, right? So Catholic means universal. The Catholic Church is the church of all nations. But what I want to posit is that there are two types of Catholic. And I mean, this is actually very clear, that there are two types of Catholic. One is the right one, and one is the wrong one. The esoteric spiritual spirituality leads one to Catholic out to the world. In other words, join universally, Catholicly. Catholicly, Catholicly, you know, in a Catholic sense, with the outside, todos, right, to the to everybody, right. Adopt your views and beliefs to the views and beliefs of the outside, todos. On the other hand, the Roman peace under the empire was the Pax Romana, right, and um, this is the appropriate type of peace for a Catholic. Pax Romana um, is where the outside conforms itself to the practice of the inside. So in other words, Rome spread itself, but it established Rome everywhere. Roman law, Roman rules, Roman governance. In that same way, we are, are called to a totos or a, or a universality of everyone coming into the church, not the church bleeding out to everyone, right? Both are Catholic in a sense, but the first is not an appropriate type of Catholic. 
the Catholic of Todos is not an appropriate type of Catholic. The Catholic of the whole world becoming Catholic, coming into the church, is the appropriate type of Catholic. Becoming like the sea of people outside the church is not appropriate. These mystical unions will often lead one to reject the inner truth um, in favor of outer political and humanitarian ends. The correct order, on the other hand, is repentance and the gospel first, ministering, ministering to the state, politics, and the body, humanitarianism. Second, right? First, it's conversion. So that's the important thing. Universality within. You know, the outside becomes Catholic. And then after we have repentance in the gospel... Then we minister to the state, politics, and to the body, humanitarianism. So preceding the French Revolution, some secret fraternities, lodges, or lodges, picked up various forms of mottos, um, that, but they're similar to um, liberty, equality, and brotherhood. And we can see um, in this, and this became in the end the philosophy of both the French Revolution and, in a sense, the American, um, the American um, motto as well. But we can see how, um, how a philosophy of todos, everyone, works so well in these principles. Well, at least the first two, so liberty and, and equality, right? Liberty releases the members from any moral requirements and instead promotes a licentious freedom. Equality is the quintessential rejection of hierarchy, tied closely to the Protestant Revolution and the breach of the Fourth Commandment. And then, ironically, fraternity or brotherhood calls the members to prefer the inside over the outside, right? So it's kind of like a flipping on the head, uh, on the head of these doctrines, right? The members over the organic community, but with a binding union be- uh, being first arbitrary, right? So it's not about again. There's liberty. There's no rules. There's and um, there's there's liberty and equality, um, and there's no no rules and no hierarchy, but th- but uh, but but you do that in you and you present that to the world, but then you out you prefer your brothers, you prefer the inside, and it's arbitrary. It's just if you're a member of my brotherhood, I prefer you. It's not about whether they're holy, not about whether they live this type of life, not about whether you live under a certain structure of rules. It's like be free, do what you want. Don't worry about your moral practices, but because you're in this group, you're my brother, and that's the that's kind of the heart of of these um, these fraternal organizations. Whatever specific lo- lodge you happen to belong to, and se- you just follow you um, you 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 prefer those people. And second, secondarily, it's libertine. It doesn't require any type of moral requirements that the Catholic Church requires, for example, of its members. We can see an internal lodge, and and I think we can see an internal lodge in the dark esoteric spirituality that people um, in sin embark on. First, we keep, so imagine ourselves, we want to look at this as a comparison, right? First, we keep secrets, right? So again, this is like fraternity or brotherhood. So we start to, we start to keep uh, an internal world with the spirit. And we talked about earlier, this idea of an internal union. We keep this internal um, brotherhood, fraternity first, right? Second, we breach rules of conduct, sin. And this is often part of what we are hiding. I, I, we're, we're hiding it. This is our liberty. This is our freedom, right? And finally, in this interior sinfulness, we reject authority and outside rules over our deceptive interior, equality. So when we form these dark, secretive unions with deceptive spirits, we attempt to set up an internal lodge, an internal fraternity, that in the end will leave us the fool. In, a, in our hypocrisy, if we do not reject it, we are going to be the ones who are the fool. Again, we have to combat fraternity with openness and honesty and clarity. And we can't hide. We've got to reject hiding, reject libertarianism or liber- libertinism, I guess you'd say. We need to follow the rules that we are that set before us. We have to follow the commandments. And we have to live a stri- we have to be willing to live a strict asceticism and observance of the Ten Commandments and the teaching of the church delivered down through tradition and through the catechism and we ought to re- reject fraternal equality with respect for authority in our parents so we can't say that we're all just equal no we have to have we respect our parents we respect our teachers we respect government we res- we, we live by laws and rules we're going to accept these hierarchies we're not going to take this this protestant led rejection of authority that then um, is is found it's, is also flourishing in this protestant um this Protestant frater- fraternal order that is the backdrop of um, that always accompanied Protestantism wherever it went.
two churches in one can also be identified by these two types of belief systems. It's shocking how different they are, and the idea that they could reside under the same roof is astounding. The new and popular practice of non-duality. If you search that term up on YouTube, um, you'll you'll get inundated by content. It is good to be non-dual. It is bad to be dual. It's a central theme of Buddhism and academic Christian circles. So it's like in the higher society in the in the, in the Christian circles are more academic Christian circles. Um, it's very popular to be non-dual or tending towards non-duality. Um, and it's finding it finds its way into our sermons. We hear sermons about non-duality all the time. It takes the fact that we are in a we are a, a monotheistic religion. The idea that we have one God, right? Well, what is the opposite of one God? Nothing, right? God has no opposite. So therefore, we are non-dual, right? And so they they lean very heavily in on this idea. It takes it takes the fact that we're this monotheistic religion and it attempts to downplay spiritual warfare that is so clearly highlighted and demonstrated by Christ in the gospel. Um, and only a liar could really uh, overlook spiritual warfare um, in the in the gospels um, and in the and in the in the culture that that surrounded Christ as well. Uh, it's an increasingly popular belief, and it also has a, a near universal universal salvation or plentiful salvation that accompanies it. Most salvation lends itself to non duality. If if most or all are saved, why worry about spiritual warfare? We are all good. To a good, pl- we're all going to a good place in the end. Then, um, this, however, it's it's an unchristian message. Christ was not born out of a time of the Psalms or the Second Temple, but he was in the Second Temple period, not in the Psalms, but the Second Temple period, in the shadow of the Book of Enoch, and the joining of the Hebraic and Greek worlds. Spiritual warfare and a teeming heaven and hell were the backdrop of his culture. To deny this is to deny Christ. Spiritual warfare is the foundation of our faith, leaving Christian doctrine. Sect relationships holders will, so, <laughs> leaving Christian doctrine, the secret relationship holders will tend away from spiritual warfare and towards plentiful salvation beliefs as they make an exception for themselves and reject the letter of the law. And I think that this ties to modern uh, practices in, in soteriology as well. Soteriology is, again, how we are saved. And um, for the first thousand years of the church, um, the, the the popular soteriological models were around um, Christ defeating Satan so that we could enter heaven. So again, it's almost like an opening of the gates to heaven. That was the first couple, the, the first the earliest ones. And then in Irenaeus, in about in the third century, we have um, we have a, 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 a soteriological model called that's called today recapitulation or reheading, right? This is where you receive a new head in Christ. So Christ, we basically conform ourselves to Christ. We become other Christs, right? So you are not saved unless you are conformed to Christ and become other Christs. Well, after the turn of the, the first millennium into the, into the uh, approaching the, the, um, the, Protestant, uh, the Protestant revolt, um, we picked up, um, new soteriological models that have become more popular and they are substitution models. The idea that Jesus saved us and he covered our sins over or he he or he, he pays the price for our sins and then we don't have to worry about um, um, uh, the walk ourselves. And so Catholics reject any kind of pure soteriological model that, but that take, takes Christ and substitutes him only for our sins. We have to take part in atoning for our sins. We have to repent of our sins and change our lives. And, and us atoning is good. But Protestants have, uh, many Protestants have wholeheartedly embraced these new soteriological models and have, have gone so far as to say that, that they're, to go into doctrines like predestination, the idea that, that Christ is simply um, chosen some for hell and some for heaven and that's all there is to it. We have no part in our, the process of our salvation at all and these of course go they go back they go back to augustine and there was inklings of these ideas there but um th- these ideas are are not like the christianity of the first millennium the the, the the majority of christian believers in the first millennium believe that if you commit mortal sin you go to hell and if you live in a state of grace you go to heaven um that if you conform yourself to christ you're on a path towards heaven if you don't conform yourself to christ you're on a path towards hell and but but this is not the um, the same doctrine, in my opinion, of a soteriological model that prizes um, 
um, substitution. So if Christ did it for us, all we have to do is believe in him and not worry about our sins. That's that's not the same thing that we heard um, from the beginning, at least not alone. We can't take that alone. We have to repent. We have to become, we have to pursue perfection. We cannot accept that we are not pursuing per- perfection. We have to be on that goal to become like Christ. And we can't have any other way. He said, unless you take up your cross daily and follow me, you are not worthy of me. And that doesn't mean that no one's worthy, therefore let Christ do it. No. It means take up your cross daily and follow him and work towards perfection like him. So the fountainheads of what I think are a proper spirituality, which is a a spirituality that incorporates a form of duality. Of course, we are not saying that God is opposed to the devil in terms of um, yin and yang or an opposite and a forward. But the idea that, that we're being tested and there are two paths for us. There is a path to death and a path to life for us, like Christ says uh, multiple times, but says, for example, in Matthew 7.13, um, there's the narrow path leads to salvation and the wide road leads to perdition. Many take it. So um, with this dual spiritual warfare that we are embedded in in this world, we'll find that if we look to private revelation, we often get, uh, interestingly, because it's the thing we're encouraged against, but often if you look to private revelation, at least the popular private revelation, you will see messages of repentance are much firmer and stronger in those revelations than you hear in the modern gospel. So there are a few exceptions. Um, and I would say to be very leery of the ones that tell you to take comfort and not worry and just lay in, lay in your in your peace of being saved. Anything that talks like that, you need to you need to watch out for those doctrines. You need to focus instead on doctrines that call to repentance and uh, renunciation of sin and a spreading of the gospel and um, and and giving of your life entirely to Christ. So again, it has to incorporate the spread of the gospel. The idea that you can just lean on Christ and that's it. That's not enough. And this is the ancient tradition. It's a, it's a tradition of the cross. It's a tradition. Uh, it's a tradition of of um, of reverence for God, and not not this idea that that you're just in this love relationship. It's not a euphoria where you kind of lose yourself and are in this wonderful joy, and that's all there is to it. No, it's it is a, a sober um, a sober mastery of the self and a turning of the self to God. And without it, we are told multiple times in uh, private revelations such as Fatima, Kita. Garibandal in the past uh, century that um, we will we will suffer um, damnation, but not only damnation, a great great suffering is going to come upon the whole earth unless we practice repentance. So that's the path forward, and um, we have to be careful not to fall into this other path um, where where we are um, keeping secrets from the community of God and living in a private relationship with the spirit that we think is God. But if, if, the, if the pursuits are secrecy in the flesh and, um, and special um, status for yourself and you, you being set apart from everybody else and being chosen, you should be very careful about that. You should be talking to people about your inter- inner experiences, your dreams, your um, visions, and your delusions. And a lot of times um, when you have these types of delusions, are, and this is true in, in very just psychological senses in things you're going to face in your own life. If you're finding yourself in a temptation, if you talk to people in your family, to people, appropriate people in your family, your parents, etc., your spouse if you're married, if you talk to people and, and lay clear the things, the, the inclination, the tendencies and the sins you've committed and the things that you're going towards, often that will overcome it. It will be destroyed because the devil lives in darkness and lies. All right, let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you. Have a good week. Bye.